check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. What's up? What's down? What is going on around? I'm Paolo Leasing, founder of Startup in Taiwan. dot com. This show is to answer your questions about starting up in Taiwan, either for business, school, or just hanging around. So leave your questions in the comments section below. Our guest for today is Raymond Ko, a returning Taiwanese from the U.S. Raymond has 20 years or over 20 years of experience in cash sales trading, Asian markets, covering a strong mix of Asian-based and North American-based client. He has built and managed a team of 11 traders and assistants in Taiwan. From that hectic career. Raymond pivoted to a career as a free diving instructor and digital marketer. Wow, he is currently based on the small island of Shao Liu Chou, off the southwest of Taiwan. Uh, that's famous for its abundant sea turtles. Wow, I didn't know that. The community there has been built on the wealth of tuna industry, with fishermen commanding about 14%. Of global tuna market share at one time. Wow, that's a lot. So our topic for today is about the business of free diving and Raymond's quest to claim his Taiwan citizenship. Raymond, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Have you? Thanks for having me on. Uh, first question: um, Could you tell us more a little bit about your Taiwan roots? Oh uh, well, I. Lived actually. Uh, I was born and raised in the U.S., but I I've lived uh, most. Taiwan is the country that I've lived most uh, in in my in my adult life. Actually, mm -hmm. um, I spent uh, three stints here for work, okay. um, and my yeah my I've had a strong influence from Taiwan because my dad actually spent about uh, seven years here on his way from Hong Kong to the U.S. And so he has a lot of classmates um, that we we I guess grew up with their families uh, in the U.S. And uh, yeah, that's okay. I guess my town roots. Okay, so we have just learned that you originally came back to Taiwan on a gold card, but now you are on your quest to get your Taiwanese passport. Could you tell us more about the reasons for doing it and how the journey is so far? Uh, the reason, um, because American citizens are targets of terrorists, so I wanted another passport. <laughs> okay. I'm just kidding. Um, okay. No, when I, I I grew up in the '80s, and I remember seeing like uh, a lot of like made-for-TV TV shows, and you know they had a lot of hijackings of planes. Then it's like, who are the U.S. citizens? And then yeah, they get uh, they get sent to the front <laughs> okay. of the the plane to be a sad, you know executed later. But no. Um, you know, Taiwan is a, a country that I fell in love with. I first uh, moved here to live in 1998, have spent 12 years since 1998 till now. Um, and I absolutely have fallen in love with the country. It, it feels like home here. It is home for me um, now. And um, I wanted to be, yeah, I wanted to <laughs> it, it officially be part of me. Um, in my heart, it's turning more and more Taiwanese. Uh, one of my best friends from university, uh, he's from Taiwan and and he would agree that, yeah, through the years, I've become uh, more and more Taiwanese at heart. Uh, can um, I can I clarify that a little bit? So, uh, are your parents uh, Taiwanese, or is there anyone from your family who is uh, born in Taiwan or a Taiwanese? Uh, not born in Taiwan. Both of my parents are from Hong Kong. Okay. And uh, yeah, but my dad did spend a lot of time in Taiwan uh, between okay. Hong Kong and the U.S. And another clarification, how do you intend to uh, move from your U.S. or to have uh, to move from your U.S. passport to having a Taiwanese passport? Uh, during my night, during my father's stay here, he managed to get his name into the household registration. Oh. And in Taiwan, that's that's good as citizenship. Oh. Um, I believe it came at a time when. The KMT uh, still had his eyes set on mainland China as being the rightful rulers of mainland China. And so they, at that time, were, um, I guess, trying to curry favor with overseas or trying to gain, yeah, the, the I guess, the, how would you say, the, yeah, the, the minds of the overseas Chinese. 
um, in their quest to take over the mainland. So my dad came over as part of, of that effort. Got it. So, so for those who are thinking about doing the same, probably those uh, Taiwanese out there abroad, could you tell us uh, briefly what are the steps needed to get a Taiwanese passport? So I do have uh, what you call, a, in, in Mandarin it's called Wuhuji Guomin, which is a non-household registration passport uh, or the citizenship. And I had to have my dad's uh, household registration uh, in Taiwan, which he managed to get uh, a copy of like uh, about five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. And I had to apply um, to the Ticos. I think I went to Hong Kong because I, I'm a permanent resident of Hong Kong. Oh. And I had to go to Hong Kong twice to, uh, to apply for it. Uh, once I did that, then I have to get an ARC. Uh, and that took a lot more documentation. And so um, thank God my wife helped me with that. She's, uh, she can, um, she's fluent in, in Mandarin. I'm not, not so much. So uh, she was able to navigate uh, and made probably hundreds of phone calls. We, we've had dozens of documents uh, notarized and mailed to Ticos in the U.S. and Hong Kong. Uh, we've had, uh, yeah, we've had sent contact with uh, Tico in Washington, D.C., Chicago, LA, San Francisco, wow. and Hong Kong. So it's, yeah, it's a, uh, it was a logistical nightmare on the documentation front. Yeah. I guess oh, sorry. translations, you know, notarized, notarized translations, all this stuff. So, yeah. I guess what many of our uh, listeners, viewers are concerned about is the requirement to do military service. Uh, may I ask if you're required to do so? Uh, no. Um, and if, I mean, they don't want this old man, I'm 48 years old. And so, uh, oh, I think, yeah, I think it's like 35 to 38. Uh, if you're over that age, then you don't need to do military service. Would, uh, it, this is just a hypothetical question. Would you do it if you were required, let's say you were younger than that age or you would wait? <laughs> I'm not sure. It really depends on the situation, right? You yeah. know, if I had time, I would think about it. But, you know, if I had, uh, you know, my family and kids to feed and... <laughs> that was a I'd long probably... pause, but yes. <laughs> I thought for a, for a while, I thought everything went off. But yeah, that was a long pause. And it's, it's a good that you still consider it based on the circumstance that may be around that requirement are female uh, females required to serve the military or is there like an equivalent requirement i've never heard of that but uh i mean going back to your last why pause so long is this you know every i i i i, I would look every experience is a learning experience and i think mm. uh, having some military experience would have been been interesting background for me mm. to learn from um so I mean, that's why I paused a bit and thought about it. It's not like, no, you know, like a lot of the wealthier Taiwanese, you know, they they, they tend to get uh, foreign passports for the sons to avoid military service. But, uh, you know, I could have benefited from some military service. And I'm sure a lot of people have. So, yeah. For sure, yeah. Uh, with all those paperwork uh, that you have uh, done, filed, how, uh, how far are you from obtaining your Taiwan passport? So Is the reason why, uh, you know, doing all the paperwork could take a couple months, three to six months. Um, it's just a oh. matter of getting uh, documents to the proper uh, institutions of Taiwan government. Um, the one complication we had was that my mother wasn't in the household registration because she's from Hong Kong. And, you know, we had it. And then she couldn't come to Taiwan for whatever reason before. It was just like, okay, next time I go to Taiwan then we'll do it, but they didn't go for a long time. And then we had the pandemic happen. And so, um, you know, thank goodness for my wife figured out a way to like my parents give her the power of attorney and the right to um, register their marriage in Taiwan and put my mom in the house of registration, my father. So that was a complication for me. This that's why I originally came on the story. Does it have to be both parents being Taiwanese yes. to be able to get your Taiwanese passport or just one? Not necessarily Taiwanese, just needed to be in the household registration. 
Got it. But I guess that means you are Taiwanese if you are in the house of registration inherently. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I cut you. But how far are you from obtaining your passports? So I need to stay in Taiwan for uh, a full year. Um, so okay. you have through the way that I'm doing it through my father or a house or a or a Taiwan citizen parent. Mm -hmm. um, you need to either stay in Taiwan for like 365 straight days, okay, or something like two years, but half a year each year, or five years, like three months each year for five years to get it. And so. Um, I, I, I did a quick exit, um, in May, uh, to, May or June to Hong Kong, literally okay. spent an hour and a half in Hong Kong and flew back just uh -huh. so I get a new stamp on my, on my Taiwanese passport and we can start the clock on the year. And that happens in June. Uh, once June comes around, then I can apply for my, some fun my, um, my Taiwan ID. And Sound that means ID. I'm truly 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 Taiwanese and I can get the passport and everything so yeah nice I'm excited I'm just about yeah not too far away so quite quite excited well I'm also quite excited, excited. <laughs> I'm also I also want to get a Taiwanese passport but from the route of someone who has an APRC then applying for uh, re, um, some sort of like um, like a local ID, like um, an ID, and then applying for the passport by renouncing my first uh, nationality. Yeah. That's so I, I'm not, that's not a requirement for me. Good. Um, Good for you. To renounce it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Let's talk about your, uh, could we talk about your newfound passion career as a free diving instructor you graduated yeah. from uc berkeley with an economics degree then you handle jobs in sales trading why free diving <laughs> well it's it's, it's um, kind of an accident um it, i back two years ago um when i discovered two two and a half years ago beginning of 2019 i just took my first course in free diving and i just loved it I loved it, and I was like, all right, I'm going to come. This is when I was working in Taipei at the time. And I was determined, okay, I'm going to make this place my second home, and I'm going to come here once a month to train in freediving. Mm. Um, and I did, uh, and then I took my second course, and I felt the like the intermediate or advanced course, and I just, I just felt amazing. I felt reinvigorated. I felt my soul, everything just felt better. And then this time I was, I was kind of suffering through – a few medical conditions that that really weighed on me in terms of um, energy levels, in terms of pain, and it was a very, very, um, you know, a, a free dive course can be quite demanding, especially when you're not now. For me, I'm I'm kind of in, in good free diving shape. It's not not a big nice. deal, but back then it was it was very tiring, but in a very good way. But I just felt uplifted. I just felt um, less heavy, uh, more mm. energy. And so it just lit this fire underneath me. And I was determined to take this as, as far as I could. And, and, and at that point, to me, it was either I become an instructor or um, I can uh, compete. But I oh. think I'm too old to be a competitor. So I thought, I thought I'd just become a, a free dive instructor. Then, uh, and, and, and I could teach it. I could slowly, over the next year, um, train up for it. And then you do it kind of part-time and something that I could earn money and pay for my passion or my hobbies. Right. And then not like literally like two or three weeks after I finished that course, uh, my company just laid me off for the second time in two years. Oh my! <laughs> and I saw the writing at the wall at that point, you know, I, I kind of put my name in to let people know that I was still looking for work in that industry or that job. But, you know, it, nobody was looking for, for an old guy. Um, and, and also my job is slowly being taken over by machines uh, and technology. So there wasn't really a need for me anymore. And I thought I need to pivot to something else. And so I went down, I moved to Indonesia for about four months uh, to train and get my instructor certification for freediving. And I thought I never had like a hard skill that people would pay for. Um, not like I can make things with my hands or I can program or anything like that. I never had any hard skills. So I thought, okay, uh, let's go for a hard skill. Worst case scenario, I could live on some island somewhere in Southeast Asia and make just enough money to get by if I really needed to, right? Um, 
yeah, and, 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 and I, I thought, okay, we'll see what happens from there. And yeah, that's it. <laughs> I thought it was just going to be like kind of a hobby, a really um, serious hobby, but nonetheless a hobby. But now it, it seems to be a full-time thing for me now. How is it so far? Do you get a lot of um, clients, students? Um, it's getting better. Now, I, I, in terms of marketing, I went through the SEO route. I, I spent a lot of time on my website. I spent a lot of time on running blogs for my website and gaining I guess exposure that way. And it took about until, so I got my website done around about a year ago mm -hmm. and it, a year or December. And I, it really didn't start ranking till September. I started okay. seeing a lot of uh, leads coming in through my website, okay. September. And that's when a lot of blog articles that I wrote started ranking number on the first page of Google. And that's when I started seeing um, nice. more is coming from that yeah so my through google google search council you can see how many people have gone to your website from searches right mm -hmm. and i would maybe get 10 12 per month through google and then um september it went to like 150 no wow. like last last month was like 250 so yeah i'm getting getting more exposure through my website we will talk about that digital marketing <laughs> career. But first, um, I just want to go back to the uh, free diving instructions as a business. Are there any specific requirements for doing this? Um, you need an instructor certification. Um, you also need to be a free dive, uh, sorry, a uh, emergency first responder certification. Mm hmm um, and liability insurance. Okay. But your, your certificates were from Indonesia training. How, how is it recognized, uh, in Taiwan? Um, not necessarily from Indonesia. It's just the schools that I went to were in Indonesia. My mm -hmm. certifications were all, uh Oh, did I, did you block out there? No, I'm here. Okay. Oh, my sc screen just went, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, certified by two agencies and they're both international first one was ida um okay. which is uh god it's something french but i don't remember uh what it means but uh it's it, ida was largely responsible for uh the development of modern day free diving in the last 20 years okay and um but i teach mostly the Molchanov's um system which is the uh, system from like two of the greatest free divers to modern day competing free divers okay um, or the family it's the father or sorry the Baltimore's family so they're sort of the new kids on the block the up-and-comers and so yeah i like teaching their system more i think it's more helpful for the students okay and now we can go back to the digital marketing so <laughs> so it looks like you correct me if i'm wrong did you discover doing digital marketing because you were trying to improve the SEO rank of your uh, free diving uh, websites, or you've been doing this for a long time. You just wanted it to like a proper way to put them together. Uh, it's, it actually started way long, maybe 2015. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I thought digital marketing is, is a, as an interest, very interesting because like I have a lot of ideas spinning in my head. Right. And mm -hmm. I think the way, uh, w the quickest way to sort of execute or test the ideas is through digital marketing. Um, and it first started when I was in 2015, I, I saw the writing in the wall in terms of my career. It wasn't going to last very much longer. I needed a side hustle and digital marketing definitely, um, something that interests me. It started with t-shirts, you know, at back then there was like Teespring and I was selling t-shirts. I was doing a lot of things on Facebook. Okay. Then uh, went into a little bit on Amazon, but you know, I saw I, I saw quickly that the power of, of digital marketing when you know it um, is uh, quite useful when you're yeah. starting out a business because it's the initial thing that's going to get you the cash flow, um, and once you get the cash flow, then you can invest in other areas that you're not really 
um, an expert in, right? And so yes. uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I quite like digital marketing. I spent a lot of time um, educating myself on it. Got it. All right, let's, let's do a fast round. Basically, you just have to tell me what comes to your mind first. Are you ready? Gotcha, yeah. What is your daily breakfast? I don't eat breakfast, I intermittent fast. All right, what is your, what show are you currently watching on Netflix? Working Moms. Um, are you a morning or night person? I think I know the answer, but yes. 100% morning person. Okay, yes, because of free diving. <laughs> well, no, I, I wake up 5 a.m. Uh, every day, naturally. I don't know why, but it... <laughs> are you are you Android uh, or iOS user? Oh, definitely iOS. So is it Mac or PC? 100% Mac. What is your favorite game or games or board games? Uh, Texas Hold'em Poker. Ooh, Does okay. that count? Yes. Uh, favorite movie of all time? Uh, can I name a couple? Sure. Uh, Princess Bride, Big Trouble in Little China, mm -hmm. and Team America. All right. You're, you're hitting all the SEO marks uh, for this Q&A. <laughs> what, <is your, laughs> what is your favorite book? I don't have like a favorite book of all time, but the, the probably the book that I read that that's that's really had a big uh, impression on me over the last say five or 10 years is uh, Buttermilk Graffiti by Edward, Ed Lee, Ed Lee, I mm -hmm. think. It's about the um, ethnic food in, in, in the US oh, and uh, fusion food, yeah. Okay, so finally, uh, how can we help you in this show and what is your action items or item? Uh, you can go to freedivenomadtaiwan.com and, you know, if you're interested in freediving, uh, look that up. I have a podcast for people who know nothing about freediving. It's called Total Beginner Freediver Podcast or Freediving Podcast. Yeah, or, or come down to Shalo Cho um, if you're in Taiwan for a visit. A lot of people who's, who've been born and raised in Taiwan or a lot of foreigners who lived in Taiwan for a long time does not know this absolute gem that's only like four hours away from Taipei. If you want more information about it, you can go Shallow Chill for Foreigners Facebook group uh, where you can you know, ask questions about Shallow Chill, but I love it here. I, I didn't know it uh, myself yeah. you know, before this interview, but you said four hours. Um, is that by train or how do you get there from Taipei? Go to Dorf, Taipei, you, you take a high-speed rail. Okay. That takes you about an hour and a half. Then you get in a car or a van that takes you to Donggang. That's about 40 minutes. And then about 20 minute ferry ride. And you're on this beautiful island, outlying island. So wow. um, I usually pick up my students or friends right at the pier. And they get off and they're like, I, they're just amazed. They're like, I can't believe how easy it was to get here. Now in this beautiful, beautiful island, right? Um, yeah, and like, you got pretty like good internet connection too. There's an internet connection off my phone. <laughs> oh, same, same. Yeah, so it's not bad. Um, yeah, like Green Island and Lanyu or Orchid Island is probably prettier, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, it probably takes you a whole weekend <laughs> to get there and back. And it's, it's a very easy weekend trip you could do to Shallow Chill. And, yeah. I'll, I'll keep that in mind because I, I kind of need some quick break to, uh, off Taipei and then maybe I'll, I can do that over the weekend. Yeah, I think those people who are remote, um, who can work remotely and don't need super fast internet connection, it is a great place. Great well, place. I would, they, I would just lack, totally, yeah. I would just totally just cut myself off from the internet just to enjoy nature, and use that on the six. Yeah. The slow internet use that as an excuse not to be on the internet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is definitely a, a great place. Uh, to reconnect with nature. All right. So yeah, thank you for, for your time, Raymond. And for our audience, uh, please uh, spread the word about what we're doing here uh, and subscribe if you haven't uh, done any. Again, thank you, Raymond, for your time. For everyone, have a great day. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys.